Anderson continues to um, need our prayers as he's looking to be mobile and Milton Kreiser uh, is battling cancer. So I did want to just, again, recycle those names in front of you. And I know that you're a praying people and I know they appreciate that very much. I also want to celebrate that we've had a little bit of a baby boom. And uh, so we are bouncing with baby boys around here, and uh, there's still a few to come. Just wait a few days. There's going to be more. And uh, so we're excited about that, that God is growing our family in awesome ways. So uh, we're praising the Lord with the, the Reynolds, the Stevens, and the Webbers as they've had babies here recently. And we're looking forward to uh, continuing to uh, bless them as uh, they are being blessed by God with these amazing children. So... Colossians chapter 3. You know, in the world today, this statement is paramount. Be true to your true self, right? I mean, you hear it all the time. Be true to you. Be true to your true self. Now, how many of you would say that that's a good statement? How many of you would say that that's a bad statement? How many of you wouldn't raise your hand for anything? (laughs) Yes. The the majority of you. Uh, Listen, be true to your true self. What is your true self? That's That's a hard thing to define. Have you ever seen one of those Russian dolls that you open up the first part of the doll and there's another one that looks just like it and you open that one and there's another one and you open that one and there's another one and you open that? Well, that's kind of like the way our lives are in a sense. Right? Where we go through phases and we transition and our true self is kind of fluid, we would think. I, I think of my own life and very, various stages of my true self. Um, I, I remember uh, when I was young, I loved cowboys and superheroes. And everything I did had either a holster or an outfit. I've told you this before. I had it on so much that one time I was out playing and there was a man that had a route, a truck route that drove in front of our house. And I was in an orange snowsuit one day, not in a superhero outfit. And he rolled down his window and he said, hey, kid, who are you today? Pumpkin man? (laughs) Right? I mean, I I was that dedicated to superheroes. I mean, I I loved them. And who didn't want to be around that kid, right? So uh, I, had a, I had a lot of friends, as you can imagine. Um, and then, then I kind of rolled into the, the jock, the preppy guy, the, um, I don't know, frat boy, thinking I'm better than everyone stage, and that guy was the worst, right? And I'm glad I've transitioned out of that world. And then I went into what presently is the pastor stage, and obviously I'm a pastor. Look at the shirt I'm wearing, the outfit I, I mean, and... Uh, Suburban dad, free Uber driver for the family. Is that my identity? Which of these are I my identity? Who's the real me? Who's the real you in life? Your bad desires? Those things that creep up inside of you that you wish weren't there? The good desires that you have, the, the works that are from God. Who is the real you. Well, Colossians 3, verse 1 through 4 really helps us with this identity language, and it kind of puts that into perspective for us. And um, I, I will tell you this, that when you know who you truly are, you can be your true self. If you don't know who you truly are, this is going to be a frustrating process for you. And the church of Colossae was struggling with their spiritual identity. And that's why he spent the first two chapters going so deep in the preeminence of Christ. He he wanted them to understand who Christ was because only when they understand Christ can they understand who they are because now they are in Christ. But they were struggling with understanding the fullness and completeness of that. And so he was laying it out for them very, very carefully in in chapters one and chapters two. And and so we enjoyed studying those. And now he's in in, in a sense kind of hitting them on the head and saying, come on, man, be who you really are in light of Christ. It reminds me of the Lion King, right? Where uh, Simba dies, and I forget who the other lion, his son is. Huh? Mufasa dies, Simba's the lion. See, I, I, I don't remember this very well. 
And so after dad dies, he forgets that he's a child of the king, right? And he goes out into the world, and he wants to forget who he really is and be a new self, and so he takes on Akuma Matata. I'm going to be whatever I want to be. I'm going to be whatever I want to do. And all of a sudden, a little monkey guy comes by, and he says, you know, who are you, right? And he, and he, he, he hits him on the head, and he says, who are you? And he, and he, and he keeps asking him this question. And, and so Simba gets so frustrated, and, and, and then he goes into this water thing, and this is kind of weird and mystical, but he looks in the water, and his dad, who passed away, kind of appears in the water. And he goes, Simba, Earl Jones Jr., of course, who you are is not what you have become. Christian, sometimes we live defeated lives. Who we are in Christ who we've been saved to be is not how we're responding today. We're not acting like who we really are. And in this passage, the Apostle Paul is kind of like saying, come on, look at who you really are. Examine that. Know who you are in Christ. Now, this is a, a transition passage um, from indicatives, right? Who we are. Our salvation in Christ, chapters 1 and 2, now he moves to imperatives, the ethical demands that flow from these grace truths. So, because of who I am, and I know now who I am, there's a certain way that I should live. Right now that I have the indicatives down, then there's some imperatives. There's some steps that I should take. There's a way that I should walk. I should live in a different way than I did before I knew Christ. It's important that we go from knowing truth to applying truth in our lives. Let, let me tell you, you're not going to stand before God in heaven and him say, well learned, thou good and faithful servant. You knew it all. What is he going to sell? say? Well done. Now, how does it get done? That is the key. We, we are created and saved for good works. So things are going to get done. God gets the glory for that getting done. But there are works that follow. Our transition, our transformation in the Lord Jesus Christ. So God has saved us through grace completely. Right? Alone, by faith alone, to do good works. Um, the Christian life is a radical image change. We were dead in our trespasses and sin. We've been raised to new life. We had a heart of stone that was dead and sinking, and now we have a heart that is alive, a heart of flesh that is able to change, that is able to be and become more like Christ every day. And we must remember the, the, the transition and transformation that has taken place in Christ. Um, and so in chapters 2, we, we studied that, that we need to make sure that no one takes us captive. Make sure that no one tells you you're not who Christ says you are. And this world has a tendency to kind of pull us into its realm again, even though we've been emancipated from it, even though we've been given a new kingdom and a new savior and a new way to live our lives. And so... The first thing that he's going to teach us in this passage is to discern your true self. Discern your true self. Let's go ahead and read Colossians chapter 3. We're just going to look at verses 1 through 4 today. If then you have been raised with Christ, Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above and not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. You know, if he starts off in verse 1, um, some translations might say since. The idea there is, 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 is there's a question in play. Are you raised with Christ? Today, if, have you been raised with Christ? Do you know Christ as the forgiver of your sins and the Lord of your life? This is the most important question there is. The if question. If, have you been changed by Christ? Are you transformed by Christ? If you have been, then there's a way that you are going to live. 
everything that Paul is going to say in the rest of this beautiful letter comes out of the fact that you have been transformed in Christ, that you are a child of God. And um, this chapter will help answer for you, if you're questioning that, what does a child of God look like? What is that transformation that takes place? What do I have my hope and security in? There have been a lot of things that help people build their identities. The identity structures through life. Um, one of the first identity structures that um, was present and in many cultures and nations is still present is the kind of an ancient way that identity is inherited, right? That, that it's, it's, it's passed down. Your, your family name, the family job, the place that you live. You didn't really ask questions like, what do I want to do when I grow up? It was told to you right? You didn't really ask, where am I going to live? Where am I going to move to? No, you were going to stay in that town. And so everything about your identity was and is kind of already figured out for you. Since we were talking about cartoons, it's kind of like the Kung Fu Panda, right? He wanted to be Kung Fu, but he was the noodle duck guy, right? He, he, this is who you are. It's an inherited. It's, it's, it's given to me. This is a culture of your duty, what I do. Um, am I bringing honor or dishonor to the family because that is who I am? And now there's a, a modern approach. And certainly as Americans, we have our self-identity, right? That, that we can be anything, that we can turn into anything. And so it's, it's we get to construct an identity. You don't inherit it, you build it. You grow it out, you make your identity. I, I, I am going to choose this for a career. I'm going to live here. I'm going to choose this person to marry. I'm going to build out my identity. What I want to be, who I am, is being determined by that. My dreams, my feelings, my desires, they'll decide who I am. And I'll construct them into an identity. And so today we have a lot of identity issues and a lot of identity struggles because we're helplessly weak in building an identity that satisfies. That there is no satisfying identity in ourselves. It'll bring conflict into your life. The same person is going to say, I want to have a very close-knit, loving, amazing family that it nurtures each other and loves each other. And, and then they're going to say, but I also want to travel the world and be wealthy and have, well, there's going to be a problem, right? They're, they're, they're heading in two different directions. And so we can see that, that conflict is going to be a part of our, our building our own identity. Um, you're always going to be changing who you want to be, what you want to do, who you love. These things are going to continually be in transition. And so your identity feels like it continues to change. And that's why, uh, you know, a, a, a man at, at 40 years old starts to have a midlife crisis, right? And as I, you know, it's like, who am I? Let's start over again. I, I need to go buy a Corvette and find a new wife and go out into a new career. Right? Always changing. Or it can be crushing. What if I can't live up to who I am? You see this in athletes. Their whole life, you've been an athlete. It's your identity. All of a sudden, I retire. Who am I? What am I? Someone that lives for beauty. Little secret, gravity wins. <laughs> Who am I? What am I now? I'm not what I once was. Right? I'm supposed to be wealthy. I'm supposed to be gorgeous. I'm supposed to be important. I'm supposed to be happy, but I'm not. So now what? It's interesting. Um, this world, when they try to talk through their identity, even successful people um, really struggle figuring out this paradox. Um, many of you have heard of Madonna. Uh, none of you pray your children grow up or your daughters grow up to be like Madonna. I understand that. But in the world's eyes, people would say Madonna is pretty successful, right? Here's what she says about her identity. My drive in life is from the horrible fear of being mediocre. I'm always struggling with that fear. 
I push past one spell of it and discover myself as a special human being and then get to another stage and I think I'm mediocre and uninteresting and I find a way to get myself out of it and again and again the cycle goes. Even though in one sense I become a somebody, I feel like a nobody that needs to prove that I'm a somebody. My struggle has never ended and probably never will. Are you in that cycle? Just identity cycle, just rolling along, figuring out who am I, what am I, where am I? Well, there's also a a Christian approach. It is something that is not inherited. It's it's something that's not um, constructed. It's, It's received by grace. It's given to us, a gift, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's, it's a gift that changes your identity. It, it's a new you, if you will, in Christ. You can't inherit it from your family. No, no, you, you, you can't have it passed on to you. You must be born again. You must receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. It's, it's not constructed. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. It's, it's a gift that we receive by grace alone. And The sad truth is a a lot of believers are so called believers, they they receive their identity from Christ, but they're trying to construct it at the same time. And that's what was going on with this church. They were finding other ways to perhaps find worth. They were finding other ways to perhaps feel more um, superior than others and and there is no rust, uh, rest in an individual that is continually having to construct their faith or trying to make God approve of you through works yes you are going to do works but those works flow out of your change in identity Amen. I trust in Christ through faith And my self-worth comes from who Jesus says I am and made me to be, period. And that is where Christ comes in and says, I will give you rest. If you're weary from finding an identity, if you're weary from, from being a gerbil on the wheel, I will give you rest. How? I'll give you an identity that you didn't have to earn. I'll take care of that for you. And so, how do we define our true selves scripturally? In verse 3, those who trust in Jesus. So, um, who is your true self? Well, it's someone that trusts in Christ. It's someone that professed Christ as their Lord and Savior. In verse 4, it says, someone with a hope laid up for us in heaven, that, that, that we're going to be with Christ in glory. This is a hope that we have. And so, define our true self. Well, how do we do that? Number one, we share in Christ's victory. Um, you know, Christ is victorious. He rose from the dead. He conquered sin. He conquered death. He conquered hell. These these are not stories. These are facts that we hold on to. They have changed our identity. We have been what? It says raised with Christ. We died with Christ. These are images that we understand our new identity through. With. That is a, a beautiful word in the New Testament. The word with. In this context, it comes from the, the Greek suffix sin, not S I N, S Y N. Sin. Now, it's interesting that we get the word sink from that. So, what does that mean? It means this that just like you sync your phone to Bluetooth, right? You with me, techie people? You are synced with Christ. You, you, are, you are brought, connected to Christ. That's your identity. My identity is not me. My identity is now that I am synced with Christ. We have become one. I, I, we, have, we have synced together. We have been synced up. We have been raised with him to new life. 
So what is true of Christ is true of us. This is a beautiful doctrine that we don't think enough about. This is the the doctrine of union with Christ. Your identity is this. You are in union with Christ. You are synced with Christ. That you and Christ connected. That is an amazing and powerful thing. His death became your death, right? His resurrection is now our resurrection. His appearance in glory is now going to be our appearance in glory. Just as Christ appears in glory, we are going to appear in glory. We are synced up with Christ. This is no small concept. Do you know who you are? Wake up to this. Live in light of this. His kingdom is now what? My kingdom. The things that are important to his kingdom are now important to me. I don't live for a kingdom of Brian anymore. I don't live for a kingdom that is on this earth anymore. I live for a heavenly kingdom and a better cause and a better purpose that will truly bring reward and blessing to my life. Are you synced with Christ? Is his victory now your victory? We sang victory in Jesus today. Do you have it? Or are those words foreign from you? It it, it is wonderful to be connected with Christ. The other day, I was in a best ball tournament for uh, Messiah's sports teams. And I, I was on an awesome team. And what I love about best ball is this. You get the score that was the end score no matter how you played. So we shot 26 under par. I never shot that before. Now that's because there's full of tricks. You can put string out there. You can do all kinds of little cheats and codes. And uh, so we kept shooting under par, under par, under par, under par. I've never scored anything like that. But here's the honest truth. I really didn't score that. The team did. Because what we did is forgot all my bad shots and just went to whatever was the best shot. So I'd hit one and it would go in the water. I went down and picked my ball out of the water, looked where the best shot was, walked over, dropped it there, right? That's my shot. I'm playing from here. Hit another ball, it goes through a window and someone, poor person's eating Cheerios and in goes my ball. I just forget that one, walk over, drop another ball, right? This is my ball. This is where I'm playing. And at the end, I got to say, this is my score. And we tied for first place, right? This is my score. Look what I, I had nothing to do with it. My team put me on their back and rode me to victory or took me to victory. Hey, honestly, that's exactly what we're talking about here. Yes, we still are struggling in this walk, but understand who you are in Christ. Who you are in Christ is is we are connected through the finished work and accomplished work of Jesus Christ. Your merit is not what's going to get you into heaven. It's the finished work, the completed work, the death and resurrection and victory of Christ and his righteousness that's going to bring you home. So, if refers to a fulfilled condition. A position was won for you. It was imputed to you in Christ, given to you by Christ. It connects the work of Christ with our dying and being raised with Christ. And we saw that in Colossians chapter two when we had a baptism the other week and we talked about how we die in our trespasses and sin and we're risen to new life in Christ. Every baptism is a celebration of our transformation in Christ, right? And and so in verse three, it says, for you have died, right? We are co in the crucifixion of Christ. So Our sin nature died with Christ. Our sins are dead and judged because through Christ, we are not going to suffer double jeopardy. It's interesting. Horrible atrocities that individuals do, if they die in the process of those horrible atrocities, they don't stand trial, do they? I mean, we just had someone walk into a school and did horrible, awful things but he was killed in the process. What happens? Well, it's over. 
There's no trial for him. He's gone. Well, here's the beautiful thing about dying with Christ. We will not stand before the Lord and have a trial for our sins because our sins have been dead and we are risen in new life to Christ. Verse three, for you have died. If then, he says, so if that's true, if you've dead in Christ and you've been risen with, with Christ, then, right, if you've been raised with Christ, then you are seated with him in the heavenlies. Ephesians 2, 6 says that. We're, we're, we're seated with Christ in glory. We have a, a reserved seat, if you will, waiting for us. It doesn't matter. It's there. It refers to a fulfilled condition that we only get through our identity in Christ. Then alludes to a change, however, a change that happens in our life. If you're truly a child of God, you have different loves. If you're truly a child of God, you have a different walk. You, you, it flows out of the union that you have with Christ. So if you've truly died to your sin, and if you've truly been resurrection, resurrected to new life, then guess what you start to live? A new life. If your life is still your old life, then did new life really happen for you? That's a fair question. Because this change will alter your nature. It will. Your new life is now in Christ. And so Colossians 1 and 2, he did a great job just exhibiting Christ as preeminent in all things. It was just pure Christology as Christ, an all-sufficient redeemer, a, a, a sovereign Lord. Would you just think for a moment and consider how expansive the chasm is between the self-existent, transcendent, holy God of the universe and sinful, feeble, depleted humans made of dust. It, it is such a wide chasm, and the only thing that could connect those two is Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, I, I read this this week. I thought it was good. The sufficiency of Christ. As the God-man and Redeemer, Christ entirely fills the infinite gap between God and sinful man. Jesus isn't part of your life. It's said in this passage he is your life. What does a, a false believer do? He keeps religion in a compartment of his life. He keeps God as one of the Russian dolls, if you will, of their identity. Christ is not a part of your life. He's not a small aspect of your life. It's not something that you do on Sundays and something that you have polite conversation about. No, a true believer, Christ is your life. Christ's kingdom is your kingdom, right? Your position, your destiny, your, your relationships, your vantage point, all have changed because you have changed. You're a new creature. And, and we, we understand that even lost people have a hunger for this change, a desire for this change, right? The human race is created with a spiritual longing for the transcendent, for something bigger than themselves. Look at what Ecclesiastes 3.11 says. Ecclesiastes 3.11. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put, what? Eternity into man's hearts yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. He, he put eternity in everyone's heart. Man is hungry for more, and that's where they try to get it with philosophies and isms and causes and all different things. This, this is what's going to satisfy me, this new doctrine, this new way to live, this new bank account, but it will not work these human initiatives. Colossians 2.8, when we studied that, they're, they're philosophies that 
go nowhere. They're ladders to nowhere. And so Christ came to destroy these dangerous philosophies and isms, right? And so Paul here is dealing with a church that is starting to lean into these isms, right? So ascetism, legalism, ceremonialism, mysticism, sacramentalism, subjectivism, antinomianism, Gnosticism, all of these isms, he's saying they're being crushed by who you are in Christ. You don't need to follow these. They're refuted by the absolute preeminence and perfect sufficiency that we have in Christ. What is a ism? It's really will worship. It's it's me making sense of me and what I want to do and who I want to be. I will. You know who said that first? Satan. I will be who I want to be. I'm not going to be who Christ tells me to be. We puff out our chest with pride and our fallen will and we say I will everything in relation to God needed by the believer is found only in Christ your favor your sonship your status your right standing your power your purpose your destiny, your bold access to God, your wisdom, your knowledge. Our entire life is upheld and provided for only in Christ. That is your identity, fully, completely. And that is the death of all isms, right? His death, his resurrection, His holiness transferred to us. And so, as a believer, you share in Christ's victory. What does that mean for us? Look at Romans 6, verses 4 to 7. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in death, like his we shall be certainly united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been, what? Set free from sin. Sin is dead to you, child of God. You say, but I still struggle. Next week, we're going to, or the, not next week, but the following week, we're going to dive into what do we do when we struggle with sin in our lives as Christians? Because in one sense, this is true, but in another sense, I'm still struggling with my walk and I have some sin battles. So, so I'm new in Christ, but yet there's a, there's a battle that I have for sin. And we'll, we'll look through some of that. But as a believer, we have a new priority and everything that was once connected to us is now cut off and we have a new life, a new vitality in Christ. And we're able to set our minds on Christ. We're able to set our minds, this passage says, on things above. Set our minds on things above. Listen, that doesn't mean that you set your mind on the fact that, oh, There's streets of gold up there. It doesn't mean that you set your mind on the fact that, wait, wait, we have mansions in heaven. I wonder what the decor is going to be like. What does it mean to set your mind on things above? Christ. He says it four times in the passage. Christ, 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 Christ. We are setting our minds on who Christ is and what Christ has accomplished for us. So we're setting our minds on Christ, the interest of Christ, the rule of Christ, the kingdom of Christ. This is what we are setting our mind on. What is Christ's position? Notice it here. He's seated at the right hand of God. He's ruling, right? He's in complete control. He's not pacing. He's not saying, oh, oh, please do the right thing. He's, he's I'm in control. And you're my child. And you're going to be because I started a good work, completed 
This is who I am. This is what I'm going to do. And he advocates for us. And perfect love casts out fear. So I don't wake up every day wondering, does the love of God still exist for me today? Neither height nor depth, right, can separate me from the love of God. Yes, he does. I don't wake up in fear that God doesn't love me. Why? Because it's not about me. It's about being in Christ, connected to Christ. Listen, this whole idea should just ooze into our veins and give us peace every day. I am in Christ. It should give us confidence when that sin keeps nagging you and staring you down. You can stare back at it and say, you lose. Because I have victory in Christ. When you find no peace for a week, you can stop and say, what am I doing? I have security and an inheritance in Christ. And breathe again. Set your affections on Christ, not on things of this earth. The problem is we can get easily distracted. The things of this earth don't grow strangely dim. Sometimes they grow strangely close, right? They're they're way too close. Don't let your life be so earthbound, swallowed up by the earth, that that you're living for things that have no eternal ramifications. No abiding significance. Where's your gaze today? Things above or things on this earth? Where's your peace? I don't have any. I can tell you where your gaze is. Where's your security? I don't have any. I can tell you where your gaze is. Where's your hope? I'm hopeless. I can tell you where your gaze is. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, right? Then worry about the world stuff. If you get that priority right as a believer, you're going to live a much more contented life. Philippians 3, verses 19 through 20. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly, speaking of lost people that don't know Christ. And they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Today, seek first the Lord. And we walk in the Spirit, Romans 8 tells us, that we don't walk like we used to walk. We don't walk in the flesh. Those who are in the flesh, it says, cannot please God. In verse 9 of this passage, it says that we're filled with the knowledge of God's will, that we're filled with the knowledge of God's instruction, what God wants us to do. So in Christ, I can walk in the will of God. I can be pleasing to God. I can do things that bring honor and glory to God. My name lifts up the name of God. This is what a believer does. But if I'm not a follower of Christ, I don't say this to be mean, but I need you to hear this. You can't be in the will of God. If you're not a follower of Christ, you can't please God. Without faith, it is, the Bible says, impossible to please God. I'm not saying you're not a good person, but you're not a God pleaser. I'm not saying that you're not a nice person. I'm just saying that you stand before God guilty. If you can't please God, you will never get the knowledge of his will. The knowledge of God's will only comes through a knowledge of Christ and abiding with Christ. You don't know him yet. You haven't died with him. You haven't been resurrected with him. As a believer... Just like a compass naturally orients north, a believer is naturally going to orient their life towards Christ. Christ's will, Christ's kingdom, Christ's desires, Christ's hopes. A new victory, a new priority. And thirdly, in verse three, 
we see that we get a new security in Christ. As a believer, you have a new security. You have died. We don't dwell in the realm of Adam any longer. That's good news. We, we dwell in the, in, in the realm of Christ. We are, it says, hidden with Christ in God. Christian, you cannot be more secure than this. You are doubly secure. You are in Christ, in God. You can't lose your salvation. You can't fall out of your faith. You are sealed by the Holy Spirit. You are secure in God. You're doubly secure, hidden, safe in Christ. Hidden from what? God's wrath. God's righteous judgment. If, if you've committed just one sin, you are eternally a sinner unless you're in Christ. Then you've been washed clean. Your debt has been paid. You stand pure. Outside of Christ, we are exposed, exposed in our sin before God. I, I am not a direct sunlight kind of guy. I don't like being exposed to the sun. Uh, I burn a little bit and it's just hot. So I'm, I'm the guy on the beach that sits under the umbrella. You know, I, I, I hide under the umbrella. I don't have to squint. I don't have to sweat. There's a little breeze. I'm a happy guy. Take me to the beach. I have no problem with that. I'm not a fan of sand either, but that I'll live. But I need an umbrella. Listen, some of you, spiritually speaking, are, are, are sunburned and beat up and parched. Why? Because you're, you're not hidden under Christ, with Christ. Jesus keeps us. He goes with us. He is our refuge. It is all through Christ. And it, in verse 4, it says, we will appear with Christ in glory, right? We're going to be like Christ. We're going to appear with Christ. Listen, if you look at a believer right now, we're, we're maybe not that awesome to the world. You look at Brian and you say, well, he's, I guess, okay, but it's not, not that awesome. Um, Dave Dyson tells a, a funny story um, that he was um, golfing and that the foursomes for best ball were being made up and he was being told who was in his group. And one of the guys that was in his group happened to be Phil Drake. And his first impression, not knowing Phil yet, was this. Ah, oh, it's the music guy at Camp Mount Lucan. Music guys aren't athletic. <laughs> well, then he played the first two holes with Phil, and Phil, like, birdied them by them himself. And he radically changed his opinion, right? Music guys can be athletic. Um... The fact of the matter is this. You're changing if you're a child of God. And you may not be what you will be, but you are going to be awesome because you are going to be everything Christ is in glory with Christ. So hold on. You struggle with sin today. You're going to defeat it tomorrow. Hold on. You have a fear battle today. You're going to have certainty tomorrow. You will be, and you will stand before God complete, fully saved. This is the promise of God. Nothing will steal it. Nothing will thwart it. Nothing will stop it. You are going to be emanating the glory of Jesus as a child of God. When Christ appears, I will be made. And child of God, you will be made fully complete, fully awesome, fully glorified. This is the promise of God. New security is ours. A new destiny in verse four. We see just a, a, a great statement when Christ what who is your life appears right who is your life what's your life today listen the apostle Paul gives a believer a short biography he says this is your life for me to live is Christ for me to die is gain that's it that's you 
summed up, Christian. It's real short and real simple. I live my life now for Christ. And when I die, it just gets better. We will appear with him in glory. The verse 4 says, then you also. All that Christ has is yours. That's what it's basically saying. Then you also, like Christ, then you also. You will be like Christ. What is your confidence that this will happen? Not your works, but your union with Christ. You're, You're qualified to go to a special place with Christ. It it has nothing to do with you. It's the accomplishments of Christ. Um, I have a brother-in-law who um, was a colonel, probably one of the, the highest that you could be in the military as a JAG. And he had a retirement party in the Pentagon. And um, so we went to this party as family and we, I, I felt like, it, it, this ages me, but I felt like I was on the show Get Smart, you know, where you, you walk down the hallways and the doors open up and then they close. And we were able to get into places in the Pentagon that I could never get without being arrested, without being with the Miller entourage, all right? And so we're walking through all of these places and I'm sitting here looking at the Pentagon going, man, this is so cool. And then someone would look funny at me and I'd be like, I'm with him, Right? <laughs> I'm only here because I'm with him, you know? And and so we're walking through and doors are opening and places are open. We finally get to this thing and have a really cool ceremony and it was really amazing. And uh, the only reason I was there is because I was with him. Guess what? You get to glory. Why? Because you've done any, no, I'm with him. His work, his completeness, his fulfillment. that's, That's why I get to go. We forever will enjoy the riches of his grace and kindness as we receive the inheritance of God. How good is God? How much does he have? All of that is for us as his inheritance. That's, how do we even comprehend this? out of the dominion of darkness into the kingdom of his glorious light. If you're not a follower of God, there is no inheritance for you, no kingdom of light, right? You're groping in the dark in this lifetime. Literally, that's what the Bible says. Men love darkness. They grope around in the darkness. They don't want to be exposed. They don't want to be known. And then guess what? You die and go to a darker place separated from God for all eternity. Believer, that is not your lot. You've been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his light and dear son, and you receive the inheritance of God. That's your identity. Ephesians 1, verses 17 and 18, and then we'll jump to 316, says this. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and the revelation and the knowledge of him. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What your riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. That according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through the spirit in your inner being. This is God's promise. 316 tells us that according to the riches of his glory, we're strengthened, we're encouraged. It it, it helps our inner being. Christian, are you living who you really are today? Are you living out your identity in Christ? Are you holding your head up, celebrating what Christ has done and what Christ has accomplished for you. You know, there's an interesting story, a gentleman by the name of Ronald Reed. Ronald Reed was a gas station attendant for many years of his life, and then later on in life, he became a school janitor. And what was so shocking was this individual that lived such a meager life and had, many would say, a a meager job existence, when he died in his bank account, he left eight million dollars. Because he knew how to take care of money, and he knew how to invest it. 
And so here he lived his whole life. And many would say that what he wore was like a janitor's outfit that was tore up and he had patches all over it, right? He could have went out and bought a new outfit anytime he wanted. He could have quitted his job anytime he wanted. He could have done a lot of things, but he decided this is the life for me. This is my identity. Listen, the real you, the real you is is beautifully changed in Christ. But the sad reality is some of you are living like paupers in your faith. The real you is rich in mercy. The real you is rich in grace. The real you is rich in your inheritance. And yet, Christians walk around all the time in their ratty jackets, satisfied with their sin life, satisfied with this world stuff, satisfied with chasing futile ways, all rumpled, all not experiencing what God has for you. Believer, if the goal of your life is not Jesus Christ, then you have forgotten who you are. Because it is all about Christ. He is your identity and he has won much for you. There's no better way to celebrate this truth than communion. And we're just gonna transition right into communion because communion reminds us of who we are because we look at the resurrection. Listen, if you're a child of God, we ask you to come to the table today and celebrate this moment of remembrance with us. This opportunity to break bread and remember the broken body of Christ, this opportunity to take the cup and remember the shed blood of Christ. And if that wouldn't have happened, there would be no remission of sins and we wouldn't be in Christ and we wouldn't have died with Christ and we wouldn't have risen with Christ, but instead we would have stayed in our sins. To remind us of the bread, the body that was broken for us. I'm gonna ask Thomas Hayes to come and pray before we take the bread. Precious Father, Holy God, as we remember the work that you have done for us on the cross, allow us to remember, Lord God, that you have died for it all, that we are with you, Heavenly Father, and we ask, Lord, by your grace and mercy and your Holy Spirit, that we remain with you, Lord God, until the end, that your will be done with us. Who am I? I'll tell you who you are. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God sent the most precious thing in heaven down to die for you. His flesh was broken so that you could be adopted into the family of God. That's your identity. In Christ, what has been accomplished for you in the finished work of Christ. And it was this Christ who wanted us to remember this. And so in the upper room with the disciples, he took bread and he said, take eat in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup. John Weatherby is going to pray for us as we prepare to take the cup. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for being the great and almighty God that you are. We think about our condition when we came into this world and we came into sinners, separated from you. And yet because of your great love, the Lord Jesus, because of your love for us, you went to that cross and gave your life to set us free from the judicial punishment of sin. Thank you for that. Help us never to forget what our salvation has cost in Jesus' name. Amen. What part of your identity right now is living like a pauper, even though you've been made a prince through the finished work of Christ? Where is there sin in your life? Confess it right now. 
One of the beauties of communion is we look at our hearts. We cry out to the Lord and we say, renew my heart. And we can do that because the precious blood of Christ was spilled. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. But with the shedding of blood, the complete work of Christ, our sins are forgiven. And we don't have to leave here in our sins. We can ask Christ, and he is faithful and just, to forgive us our sins. If we're a child of God, we cry out and ask him to forgive. And burdens are lifted. A Calvary. Christ took the cup and he reminded them that there's a new covenant through the blood of Jesus Christ. He said, drink this in remembrance of me. Father God, we are so thankful for the identity changing, grace-filled, faith-filled transition, transformation that has taken place in our lives as believers that are in Christ. It's changed everything. And we humbly praise you. We humbly thank you. We remember passionately that this was not cheap grace, but it cost Christ his life. And Father, you turned your holy back to your son so that you would not have to turn your back on us because we have become in Christ and his righteousness has been given to us through him taking on our sin and our failure, our foolishness. Lord, may we remember every day who we are. Not in us. Not in what we've constructed or not in what we've inherited, but who we are in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.